In the history of World War II, there have been many disasters in which a submarine attack was the cause of thousands of deaths. However, the well-known tragedies of the Wilhelm Gustloff, the Goya, or the Laconia left the first such incident in the shadows. Now, few people remember that the first such catastrophe, which caused the deaths of almost 1,000 people, happened in 1940. Then one of the most famous German submarine aces caused the deaths of hundreds of his own countrymen. I could hardly expect to fight with a wooden rifle, said a furious Gunther Preen to his commander Karl Donitz after the U-47 returned from the Norwegian fjords in April 1940. However, Donitz was well aware of his officers' emotions about his blunders caused by faulty torpedoes. The torpedo crisis hurt the faith of German submariners in their weapons. Therefore, the commander of the submarine forces tried as soon as possible to restore this faith by making torpedoes more reliable. The measures taken gave a certain result and in May-June 1940, deadly cigars again began to sink merchant ships in the Atlantic. On the evening of June 3, 1940, U-47 left Kiel for her sixth combat cruise. For the ambitious bull of Scapa Flow, it was an opportunity to forget his Norwegian failures. But before she could start winning, the boat had to take part in rescuing the crew of a German bomber that had been shot down by a British fighter and fallen into the sea. On the morning of June 6, U-47 found an inflatable boat with three airmen who were taken aboard. The submarine ace and his crew were determined to succeed, so when the first torpedo fired missed its target on the morning of June 14th, the morale of the submariners did not suffer. On U-47, everyone was eager for victory, and it did not take long. By the evening of the same day, Prin opened the account in this campaign, when the shot from the stern, torpedo Aperitu sank the British ship, Balmoral Wood, lagging behind the convoy. Thanks to a serviceable torpedo, the British lost valuable cargo. Almost 9,000 tons of wheat and four planes went to the bottom. In the evening of June 21st, south of Ireland, Ryu-47 attacked the convoy NH-49. At periscope depth, Prin snuck inside his order and fired three torpedoes at two tankers going in the middle of the central column. He had time to see the first torpedo hit its target, but then had to urgently withdraw to deep water to avoid a collision with a vessel that was coming straight at him. Deciding that the other torpedoes also hit the target, Prin credited two tankers of 7,000 baht each. However, the underwater ace was wrong. The first torpedo hit the huge British tanker San Fernando, which sank the next day while being towed to port. Curiously, the Norwegian had a tonnage of 13,056 boots, which was not much less than Prine's claimed 14,000 Biratol. By this time, an event had occurred which played an important role in the future. On June 16th, U-47 intercepted a radiogram from U-46, which reported to HQ that it had sunk 53,000 baht. The latter was now commanded by Prine's former watch officer, Oberleutnant Zurze Engelbert Endras, who in the first campaign first sank the British auxiliary cruiser CMS Corinthia, and then several ships. Indras's actual successes on the campaign left four ships and one 35-347-BT ship, with another large vessel of 8,782-BT damaged. As Prin wrote in his memoirs, U-46's radiogram boosted the ego of the crew of U-47, which was pleased with the success of a former colleague but was not going to give in to him. As a result of unannounced socialist competition, in addition to the above-mentioned two ships, from June 22 to June 30, U-47 sent to the bottom five more, reporting to headquarters on the sinking of 51,086 by Brett. However, this was clearly not enough to overtake Indras. By this point, there were only six shells and one faulty torpedo left on the boat. Prin instructed the torpedo men to make sure it could be used. The commander's orders were carried out, and such a chance came on the morning of July 2, 1940, when a passenger liner was sighted from the boat. The ego of Prine and his crew was satisfied. That morning, the victim of U-47's last torpedo was the 15501 BT British liner Arandora Star. Endras' result was exceeded and the boat set course for base, arriving at Kiel on July 6. 
However, the Submariners from U-47 would not have been so pleased with their success had they learned that they had caused a great tragedy, purely English murder. With the outbreak of war, German nationals in British territory were subject to internment, a rule later extended to Italian nationals. Legally, these people were defenseless against such actions, as their rights, unlike prisoners of war, were not stipulated in either the Hague or Geneva Conventions. The May defeat in France and the surrender of the latter put Britain in danger of invasion by the Wehrmacht, not surprisingly, the hostility of the British to the Germans and Italians increased. Foreign nationals held in concentration camps were joined by British citizens of German and Italian descent, and even refugees from Germany fleeing Nazi persecution in England. Drawing on the experience of World War I, by the summer of 1940, the British had collected in such camps about 8,000 internees who were to be further deported to the Dominions. One shipment of internees was being shipped to Canada on the liner Arandora Star. In the early morning hours of July, Texas, 1940, the ship left Liverpool with a total of 1,673 people on board, which included 479 German and 734 Italian inner names, 86 German prisoners of war and 200 guards. Once in the ocean, the liner continued her journey without escort, traveling in an anti-submarine zigzag at 15 knots, but at 0758, hereafter given as Berlin time, the ship was torpedoed by U-47 north of Ireland. The torpedo hit the engine room, disabling the turbines and all generators. The liner's radio operator managed to transmit a distress signal, which was picked up by shore stations. The liner stayed afloat for a little over an hour, and during this time the crew managed to launch life rafts and lifeboats. Some of the latter were full of people, others remained half empty. Many passengers, mostly Italians, were afraid to leave the ship, preferring to stay on board. Captain Edgar Wallace Moulton and his officers remained on the ship until the last moment, directing the evacuation. They were assisted by one of the internees, Otto Burfind, former captain of the German liner, Adolf Vormann. Both captains were killed. Moulton was subsequently posthumously awarded the Lloyd's Military Medal for Bravery, and Burfind was mentioned in the British press. At 0920, the liner sank taking many people to the bottom. Among the dead were 55 crew members, 37 guards, 243 Germans and 470 Italians. A total of 805 people. Help arrived hours later. First, a four-engine Sunderland flying boat appeared over the survivors and dropped first aid packets, cigarettes, and provisions. The plane circled the disaster site for an hour, waiting for the Canadian destroyer HMCS St. Laurent, which had been dispatched to conduct a rescue operation. The destroyer took five hours to bring survivors aboard. Getting people from the lifeboats was not the most difficult task. It was much more difficult with those holding on to the water clinging to the wreckage. There was a lot of oil in the water, and soiled people could not hold on to the slippery ropes dropped from the ship. So the sailors from the destroyer were forced to pull the men aboard with the help of bowlines. By evening, the St. Laurent had picked up 868 men, including 586 Germans and Italians. The destroyer, including its crew, now had about 1,000 men on board. The small ship was literally packed with people, for the accommodation of which were used all the living quarters of the Saint Laurent and even one of its boiler rooms. The crew of the destroyer, as best they could, took care of the rescue. The next day, Saint Laurent delivered the shipwreck to Greenock, sent after him to the scene of the disaster. British destroyer Walker, HMS Walker, found no living people. Following the sea began to give the bodies of the dead. July 30, 1940, on the Irish coast were found the remains of 71-year-old Italian Ernesto Maruzzi, Ernesto Maruzzi, and four more people from the lost liner. During August, the Atlantic brought 200 of the 13 bodies to the Irish shore, of which 35 were identified as victims of the Arandora Star and another 92 as possible passengers of the liner. The rest of the dead were not identifiable due to their long stay in the water. However, the tragedy of the rescued Germans and Italians did not end. 
The destroyer took them to Scotland, but they were not released. The former passengers of the Arendora Star were again sent to internment camps, after which they were still taken out of the metropolitan area to Australia. Missed benefits. The world learned of the tragedy on the next day, July 3, 1940, when the British press announced the torpedoing of the liner Arendora Star on its way to Canada with 1,500 interned Germans and Italians on board. It was also reported that about 1,000 people had been rescued. Five days later, the Reuters news agency gave the exact death toll. This information created a very sensitive situation for both belligerents. Germany had an excuse to deal the enemy a strong propaganda blow, avenging the hysteria in the press after the torpedoing of the German submarine liner Atenia at the beginning of the war. Upon learning of the incident, the Kriegsmarine Command began to figure out how to capitalize on the incident. As a result, the fact of the deaths of almost 1,000 people, of which several hundred were Germans, was hidden not only from the crew of the U-47, but also from the entire German public. It is worth noting that fate almost gave Gunther Prynn a chance to get ahead of the actions of Lieutenant Commander Werner Hartenstein for two years. Had U-47 surfaced after the attack alongside the survivors, the incident with the Arendora Star might have appeared in the history of the war instead of the well-known incident with U-156 and the Laconia. It is impossible to say for sure, as it is not known whether Prynn would have dared to violate the order number 154 given by Dennitz at the end of 1939 or not. Thus, the interned people found themselves hostage to a dual situation. On the one hand, it was the unprotectedness of international laws that allowed them to be collected on a liner for deportation to Canada. On the other hand, it was the brutal rules of submarine warfare, where the benefits of surprise attacks by ships were put before the lives of their own citizens. All this led to the sinking of the Arendora Star being the the first such incident in the history of World War II with the loss of so many civilians. In a bitter irony of fate, they were German and Italian citizens killed by a German submarine.